Welcome to the Viking AIDS podcast, the official podcast of thevikingaids.com. My name is Chris Shad. I'm a writer for the Viking AIDS Zone coverage. Bring me the news and the Brookings Register. We do this every Monday with a late week episode right here on the Viking AIDS YouTube channel. And we're in podcast form on Apple and Spotify the very next day. But however you consume us, make sure you rate, comment, like, and subscribe so you never miss a new episode and we can spread the word to the masses. Today's guest, you can see him on the screen right now. He is an NFL draft and college football analyst for Fantasy Pros and Betting Pros. He is also a member of Fantasy Football Weekly, and you might know him as a frequent guest on Score North's Purple Daily. His name is Thor Nystrom. Thor, a lot has changed since we last talked. Kirk left in free agency. The Vikings desperately need a quarterback, and they may have just made a trade to get one. So I figured I figured it was a good time to give you a call. Yeah, it, a lot has changed since we went to bed last night. Uh, <laughs> you wake up this morning, and the Vikings have traded for another first-round pick. This is obviously setting up for the real move, which is trading up to get one of those top four quarterbacks. Uh, to do it this far in advance is very exciting. And to do it at the price point that, that Kwesi got is uh, very exciting as well. So, yeah, it's a very exciting day. I'm still trying to get my my thoughts around it, but uh, the, the fact that the Kwesi struck now and at the price point he did, like I said, uh, very promising for the Vikings here for the next six weeks. I, I wouldn't say it's like waking up on Christmas morning because we, we don't have a top five pick yet. But it's it's like a night of drinking. You go to bed and you wake up smelling bacon. Like the, that is basically where well we said. are right now in yes. this uh, in this trade. Uh, the trade that just went down. The Minnesota Vikings send the number forty two overall pick, the number one hundred eighty eighth overall pick, and a twenty twenty five second rounder to Houston for the twenty third overall pick and the two hundred and thirty second overall pick in the NFL draft. Long story short, the Vikings now have two first round picks in this draft, the 11th overall pick and the 23rd overall pick. Do you think this is a precursor to go get a quarterback or what what are we doing here, Thor? Very clearly. Yes. Uh and and in a very clever way as well. Uh you know, like whenever we talked about we, I mean, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now of what is that cost going to be to get to 5? And then, you know, to potentially four or three. So you start doing that. And the the price point for all those trades, you always started with next year's first round pick, which is fine. I mean, if, you, you know, Kirk leaves, the quarterback is the one thing you need. You get the right rookie scale quarterback with the infrastructure the Vikings already have. And then the projected number one most salary cap space in the NFL starting in 2025. You know, that that's what you're looking for. However, the only problematic thing about it was next year's Vikings team. That's the one where you have to swallow the pill of all your cap indiscretions from past years. The Vikings will have the most dead uh, money on their cap this coming year. Next year's team is going to suffer a bit because of that. Uh, you know, I don't want to call it a, a rebuild. It, it's essentially a one year reset year. Well, the thing with that is, you know, what would you project the Vikings record to be next year? Hey, what six wins, seven wins, something like that. They're gonna that pick that they're gonna have is almost assuredly going to be in the top half of the first round. That was my only trepidation about giving up the next year's first round pick. Having done this trade without giving up your future first, now you get the extra one. You now have enough ammunition to get up into the top five potentially without giving up your first round pick from next year because of the way that the trade chart works out. So that that's what I love most about this trade and doing it so far in advance gives you so much flexibility and gives you power over the board that you did not have before. And I think that's the key word there is flexibility. You know, yesterday, Kevin O'Connell and Kwesi Adolfo Mensa, they have their uh, free agency press conference, so to speak. They're sitting there like, well, we don't, we, we could just start Sam Darnold. That's totally fine. It's, it's kind of like, what else was he supposed to say? Just like, use us. You, we are so desperate for it. Kirk, Kirk Cousins left. We, we need to win nine games to save our jobs. Just use us. But you know, let's say, let's say the price to get to four or maybe a top five pick is just astronomical, or there's another team that just goes completely crazy to get JJ McCarthy or something. You know, you look at this, the Vikings could get a solid player at 11, keep building that infrastructure and then use the number 23rd pick to either take Penix or trade down and still get Penix in that late first or second round. Do you think that's a possibility the Vikings are thinking about, or is this all top five or bust at this point? Well, 
this is another beauty of of that of, of the trade that they just made is you know it not only gives you the that power that i was talking about it not only gives you the ammunition to potentially move into the top five without touching any future first round picks it also re, you regain leverage in doing it sort of under the radar because now the vikings have a real threat that they can give those teams in the top five if they're you know i'm talking about the patriots the cardinals the Chargers, the three teams, the, theoretically, that they are engaging in trade talks. Before you, there is a perception, and it's reality. You could have held them over the barrel, you know, because of what you you were sort of setting up there. The Vikings were in sort of the more of a desperate situation there, and that's where you have to start dipping into the future years. But now, because of of this trade, like I said, not only do you have that ammunition, but you can also make the argument let's say to uh, Elliot Wolf of the Patriots or to Monty Austin Fort of the Cardinals or to uh, Mr. Harbaugh with the Chargers and tell them, look, we're not going to give you multiple future first round picks to get this done. We just can't do that. We have multiple first round picks. We have two picks within the top, what, 23. Um, if that's not good enough, that 23rd pick, hey, we love Michael Penix. We love Michael Penix. We are totally fine taking Michael Penix at 23. If you don't want to take the fair trade offer that we have on, on the table right now, no problem. We'll stick and pick at 11. We'll take the best defender that falls down to us. We'll take Michael Penix at, at 23. Now, do I think that that's their actual plan? No. But in any negotiation, you need to have leverage. Beforehand, what leverage did Quasi have? You, you know, it's like at the press conference yesterday that you alluded to. Quasi felt the need, and I totally understand why, because you're sitting at a poker table with 31 other Sharks. He felt the need to come out and say, well, you know, Sam Darnold could be the quarterback next year, and, you know, we're not necessarily saying that we're going to take the quarterback, whatever. Why do you say that? Because you're trying to create leverage where there isn't any. Now he just got some real leverage with that 23rd pick. He got the ammo, but you also get leverage back. You could tell other teams, hey, Penix is really high on our board. He, he is right there, you know, with the on the precipice of that top four. We believe he's worth the 23rd pick. We are not in the desperate situation that you think uh, that we are. We're not in a situation like the 49ers uh, with the Trey Lance trade uh, multiple years ago where they gave up the two firsts in, in the future, whatever. We're fine sitting back if, if you're not going to take a, the fair offer that is on the table. So I, I think it's a sort of a twofold thing. And again, the, the big thing for me, if you had to overpay to do that this far in advance, I, I think maybe you'd argue against it. The Vikings got a really good trade here. I, I'm only talking value, right? Like the, the other stuff I'm talking about is 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 the the nice ways in which it sets up your next move on the chessboard. But just this move in a vacuum, you got good value on that trade to move up. Houston, I, I think from their point of view, I have to imagine this this is what it is to do this trade this far in advance. They have set up their board. They have their top fifty. I would guess that their scouting department is saying there is not a huge discrepancy here on our board between, say, 15, 18, and 45 or 40, right? Like where you would project the different guys at those two different picks, whatever. So I think that, that their ideology is we don't believe as far as their board, they don't need a quarterback. They got a stud in last year's class with their board. It, it's more or less a wash moving down a bit and we're recouping a second round pick next year, which like I argued before, probably going to be in the top half of that second round. So they get two high second round picks. I, I think that's where Houston is coming from, but just from a trade value perspective, trade chart perspective, the Vikings got a good trade there. And, and let's, let's think of it this way. The Vikings are probably going to get two third round comp picks next year in the compensatory yep. process for losing Kirk Cousins, losing Daniel Hunter, uh, KJ Osborne and Dalton Reisner are probably on the way out. You're getting that. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the Vikings are getting eight because the Falcons tampered with Kirk Cousins. <laughs> please, oh boy, please, learn, nice. please learn the tampering scale. Like people, come on, let's, yeah. let's be reasonable. I, I, here. I wish, I wish it worked that way. I always, they got anything for it. Uh, give us yeah. a, give us the Falcon sixth. Uh, yeah. I actually don't understand why when they penalize for that, they just take the pick away. It feels yeah. like it should be conveyed to the other team, but i that's a discussion perhaps for another day. Um, you know, if we got the Falcon six round pick and we took Tory Taylor out of Iowa, oh, it, would be total, it would be totally worth it. They would just exactly. give us a nuclear weapon to add to this roster. Exactly. Um, now that the Vikings have made this trade, you know, it's pretty obvious they're going to try and get a quarterback in this draft. 
And we got to talk about who the guy that has gotten the Vontae Mack approval award uh, from you is JJ McCarthy, the quarterback out of Michigan. You know, what is it about JJ McCarthy that makes him a potential top five NFL pick? Well, he's got all the tools, uh, spectacular athlete, uh, didn't run at the combine. He's going to run high four fours, low four fives at his pro day. If he does run, we have very reliable reports on that. There's a lot of people in the Michigan program that swears that he was running four fours when they were timing the kids and, and that sort of stuff, the forties with the, the Michigan stuff. Um, he did do the three cone at the NFL combine after weighing in 17 pounds heavier than he was listed at Michigan and did the fifth fastest three cone of the entire NFL combine, irregardless of position. He also uh, the, had the second fastest velocity throw. The, the record is 62. Josh Allen had that before. Joe Milton matched it. J.J. McCarthy had 61 miles per hour. Those are quantifiable things. But as far as the on-field eval, this is a guy, you have the athleticism, you have the arm strength. They play in conjunction with one another, and that is super important. You have some prospects who are athletic and have a good arm, but they do not work with one another. Joe Milton's a great example of this. You're never going to see Joe Milton throwing a dime on the run to the second or third level. That doesn't happen. McCarthy has both the vision and the arm uh, for that. The way he scrambles around, he keeps his upper body cocked to throw and his eyes downfield the entire time with his legs under him. You always see that as, as he's moving around. He, he does move around. But it is always with that the upper body cocked and and that in the throwing platform under him, so he can get the throw off extremely quickly. His accuracy does not depreciate on the move because of this, because he takes his mechanics with him. Last year he was seventy two percent and change uh, percent completions, uh, just uh, rotely uh, on the stat line. Scrambling was seventy one percent and change his accuracy percentage. He barely loses anything. You don't really see that any quarterback their accuracy starts to depreciate on the move. McCarthy's really doesn't. Uh, I love all that different stuff. I love that he went to Jim Harbaugh's uh, NFL factory at Michigan, uh, an NFL style program that they have built there. Certainly an NFL style pro style system. JJ McCarthy, who is this out of structure. Uh, prospect this, this this sterling out of structure kid come this wild stallion of an out of structure prospect coming out of high school goes to michigan and in so doing kicks out Cade mcnamara from the starting job year two Cade mcnamara who had previously kicked joe milton out out of the starting job and then in year three as a true junior year three junior 20 years old jj mccarthy wins a national title he proved in doing that that he can win within structure we know he can win outside of structure we know he has all the physical tools. We know he's a super sharp kid. We know that everyone at Michigan fawns over him. So much so that Jim Harbaugh, now the Chargers head coach, they picked fifth, believes that he should go number one overall. And everyone that you talk to at Michigan, they would fall in line with that opinion. They all love J.J. McCarthy and they love his potential, everything like that. You talk about the intangibles. You talk about the physical ability and even the stats. You know, people just talk about the volume stats. You can't talk about the volume stats with him. Last year, Michigan had 21-plus point lead in 11 of their 15 games. J.J. McCarthy did not take one fourth-quarter snap in seven of those 15 games. You, you can't talk about the volume stats with him. He also didn't get the empty calorie stats that, for instance, Bo Nix did. Oregon last year played the, the aggregate 80th-ranked defensive strength. That was their average opponent strength on defense. And then Bo Nix played in this Mickey Mouse offense where it spread the field take the snap and shotgun and immediately throw to your first read, which you got before the snap by doing the numbers advantage thing, just counting where you have the numbers advantage on what side of the field, whatever, uh, and getting these empty calorie stats where the yak yardage was, was a big uh, percentage of the passing yards that, that you threw for. J.J. McCarthy didn't have any of that. When he threw, it was on third down. When the defense knew what was coming, you know who the best third down quarterback in this class was by margin? It was J.J. McCarthy. And by the way, to the first half stuff, so Michigan played the best defensive strength of any of these top six quarterbacks uh, by far. I, I, I got the numbers here. They, they played the 38th uh, average defense on the aggregate. The next highest of the top six quarterbacks is Jaden Daniels, 47. Penix was 57. Drake May was 61. Let's just – you only look at the first half of games against top 25 defenses of these different guys – Michigan asked J.J. McCarthy to throw on a much higher percentage of their downs in those situations 
than any of these other quarterbacks if you take out screen passes. Uh, J.J. McCarthy, in those scenarios, uh, well, did, so this is just against top 25 defense. You take out uh, screen passes. 49.7% of, of the downs up for Michigan were passing downs for McCarthy. Next highest guy was Caleb Williams at 35.4. The other guys weren't over 20% because you had a lot of Mickey Mouse nonsense with the screen passes and different stuff like that, especially against the, the good defenses, or they would lean more heavily into the run game. Michigan would go the opposite direction. They ran and ran and ran rough shot over the crappy opponents. And that's when J.J. McCarthy would get taken out early because they were flogging people by 28, 35, whatever. Um, in the first half against good defenses, that is where you saw the NFL NFL utilization of J.J. McCarthy. And in the high leverage situations, you start breaking his splits out into that. That is where he begins to shine as a top three quarterback in this class. I love how you called McCarthy a stallion when referring to Michigan. That's kind of a nice little tie in there. You did. I, it probably wasn't intentional, but I, yeah. I mean, I, I picked it up. I saw you went to there. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about some of the other quarterbacks. You mentioned him a little bit, Drake may, there's some people who believe the Vikings like him a little bit better because they hired Josh McCown, who is their quarterback coach. Now he coached Drake may in high school. You know, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses to may's game? And, you know, do you think he's slipping a little bit or is this like the subterfuge before the draft where everybody kind of, I don't want to say smear campaign, but everybody tries to get everybody to fall to them. Yeah, I mean, so to the the first one uh, about the slipping thing, I think, you know, in terms of public perception, I, you know, like that's the way that these things play out. But on NFL draft boards and different stuff, like, you know, like, and, and the reason for that perception is obviously, you know, heading even into last regular season, this this class was viewed as Caleb Williams will be the number one pick. That's with the bullet, carve it in stone. Drake May will be the number two pick, carve it in stone. And so that's when we came into this draft process. That was still uh, sort of the narrative. But when you get into the 2023 tape and you get deeper into these evals, th you can really start poking holes in that with, I think, with regards to Drake May. Uh, I, I have Caleb Williams as the QB1. Uh, Drake May is my QB4. Uh, there Are there things to like about Drake May? Of course. Yeah, I, I, I still think that Drake, Drake May is worth a top 10 pick. And if the Vikings, they their move was for Drake May, I wouldn't argue against that. I, I would be happy with that. But the reason that I believe uh, that, that I have J.J. McCarthy ranked higher and that I've argued that uh, perhaps he should be drafted ahead of uh, Drake May, the things that McCarthy is awesome at that project really well to the NFL, some of those things Drake May is not as good at, or they're, they're the questions of, of Drake May's evaluation. Uh, the, the One of the biggest ones for me is that I noticed with Drake May's tape is He's good with manipulating the pocket, right? So right after the snap, in terms of moving around in such a way where it helps out his spacing to, to allow him to have more, more spacing, sort of that halo of safety around him. So the platform will be there. But when the pressure starts to get a little bit closer, and I'm not talking about when the guy's about to deck him, but I'm, I'm talking about when it starts to get into his kitchen a little bit, I noticed a bad habit with Drake May where at that point, and, and this is, again, this is not when he's about to get hit. This is about, you got about a second left and you could square up and, 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 and step into a throw. What I noticed instead, a propensity for Drake May was to essentially hit the fast forward button on his mechanics to try to get the ball out immediately in those situations. He doesn't have the athleticism to escape. And so a lot of times it was just, you know, speed up the process, speed up the process. Well, what does that do? You're forgetting your mechanics at that point. And that's where the ball starts to get Aaron on him. Drake, and, and you see this in his stat profile. Drake May under pressure last year, 2023, 39 for 90. That's 43% completions, 7 to 5 TDI and T rate, under a 60 PFF passing grade, uh, nearly a 4% turnover worthy throw uh, uh, rate, and 28 sacks taken. That's my concern with me. Doesn't have the athleticism to escape those situations. And as far as the throwing goes, he needs to develop a better plan or to have that gumption to step up into the pressure at that point. There's times where you got to eat it. And there's times where he's speeding up the process where he wasn't going to get hit, hit either way. So it, it's one of the, that's a coaching thing. Do it, is he going to improve at that? Is that thing going to go away? That I don't know. That is what his on-field thing where, there was some doubt for me where it clouded a little bit. And then you, the, the other thing, which is talked about more, 
I don't want to say it's overblown. It it is a thing. Um, it's you occasionally see glitches with his decision making, and now it's not all the time. Uh, but there there are glitch. The, the Clemson play has been you know uh, passed around where they were near the goal line, and he's looking, looking, and then he just throws it right to a Clemson linebacker. Just throws it right into his chest plate. Um, you see some plays like that with Drake. Now, it, again, this is not a regularity thing, but there are on some reps, his brain will just glitch. You do see that. And so it, that can lead to catastrophic plays the other way in a way that you did not see on J.J. McCarthy's film, just for instance. So those those are the two things with that. The last thing I'd say is people were forwarding uh, Drake May as like, you know, Justin Herbert or Josh Allen and – the way they were trying to do that was this guy is also a dual threat and, you know, he can run around and you're going to be able to do all that stuff. And he's got the bazooka arm. I agree with the bazooka arm. That's the best part of his evaluation. That athleticism is not carrying over to becoming an NFL rushing threat. He is going to be more or less confined to the pocket in the NFL. He is not even close to the athlete that Josh Allen is. He's not even, not even close to the athlete, in my opinion, that Justin Herbert is. In 2022, he led UNC in rushing because of the Phil Longo offense. That's the thing of like, we're going to take the one-on-one -on -one shot deep, but if you don't like the look, you just take off and run. It's the reason why Sam Hollow, his last year in the Phil Longo offense, ran for over 1,000 yards. That obviously did not translate to the NFL, seeing as though Sam Hollow's not Fran Tarkenton or whatever. Um, so, I mean, that's those are my concerns with May. And those are things that, that McCarthy's really good at. May is not good when you get him out of the pocket, not as good uh, in, in those situations, not as good off-platform, different stuff like that. I like him as the pocket passer guy. Uh, he has that howitzer for an arm. He's really, really good downfield. But there are a couple things in his on-field evaluation that I don't think uh, were certainly talked about enough earlier in the process or coming into the process. Um, I think some of those things now, there's more of a microscope on those. I, I think more people have watched his film, all of it from 2023. 2022 is when it was really good because that Longo offense, it was leaning into all Drake May's strengths and leaning away from all of his weaknesses. Last year, that changes a little bit. And then you saw a depreciation in his game. Again, nitpicking concerns, perhaps. I still think he's a top 10 overall guy. Absolutely. But um, that's why I would put McCarthy above him. I'm going to combine these two guys just for time constraints here, but I, but I think they're worth talking about when we say, Hey, what quarterback could the Vikings draft? You have Jaden Daniels. He's projected now as a top three pick. Uh, a lot of people have him going to Washington right now, but he's a guy that is on the Vikings radar. You also have Michael Penix who left-handed quarterback out of Washington struggled in that national title game against Michigan. But there are a lot of people who think that he could be a good fit for this offense between Daniels and Penix. What could the Vikings see and, and do any of them fit what they want to do? Yeah, I think so. Um, the, you know, as far as like Daniels goes, um, he brings the two superpowers to the NFL. It's it's the deep throwing touch. He's really, really good at that attacking downfield. And then it's the athleticism to break containment. He's he's the really good runner. Uh, he's His feet are quiet in the pocket and he goes through the progressions. Um, and so you have all that different stuff. He he becomes sort of, it becomes a spacing problem where the defense is like, do we keep the resources deep? Do you keep the two high safeties back there to take away the deep ball? But if you do that, you can't spy uh, Jaden Daniels. You can't try to speed him up by by blitzing him at all. But if you keep a spy on him to try to, to try to keep him behind the line of scrimmage, now you're probably seeding the the deep ball on one side or the other, putting someone on an island. It's a bad, bad uh, that's a big mistake against Daniels. But then if you try to blitz him, uh, we found out last year that really doesn't work either. He's the highest PFF graded uh, quarterback under the blitz in this class. So th those are the things that, that I like about Daniels. Th there's a couple of things in his profile that, um, you know, you can nitpick or that, uh, uh, you know, th creates some some doubt there or, or, or elevates the risk profile just a little bit, I should say. Um, he's, he's tall, but he's super duper skinny. And he is not great. At, like right now, he doesn't have the inclination to slide. That's the thing that he's got to get taught. Like a lot of times in college, he would just keep running and then he'd just get blasted. That's where the play would end. Um, we, we need, He needs to learn how to get down in the NFL when he does break the containment and get upfield, different stuff like that. And then the one thing as far as the KOC offense that would be interesting to see about the fit on 
and, and this goes for Michael Penix as well. These are like the top two guys in terms of this. Daniels didn't attack the middle of the field last year. Now, was that a scheme thing or was that, uh, you know, a preference of Daniels? Daniels deep ball is better than his intermediate velocity. I, I will say that. Um, but KOC's offense, it has those layering concepts and they love to attack the middle of the field and the, the middle of the field throws are more important in the NFL anyway because of the spacing thing. That's the thing that starts, you force the the safety to come up a little bit. That's what opens up some of your deeper shots down the field, different stuff like that. That's why the NFL fetishizes the intermediate accuracy, fitting it into a window and attacking that middle of the field. So the defense can't delineate their resources everywhere else and just leave it open because they know that you're not going to attack it, whatever. So that, that would be with Daniels. Uh, as far as Penix goes, uh, he did get the clean bill of health back from the combine. Uh, I, obviously, that was really good. He needed to get that. Uh, I like his Penix's arm. Um, but the problem with with Penix or the reason that I that he's a second rounder for me is on the field when you I think of him as like a sniper, you know, like you're up there and you have the gun on the thing and it's not moving at all. And, and in those scenarios, you you can hit anything. But the more that you are moved off your spot at all, your accuracy goes down. That's Michael Penix. He's the sniper where if you push him off his spot, he's not going to hit the shot. The more he has to move off his spot, the more his accuracy goes down. He is not good throwing on the run, a uh, different stuff like that. Uh, so if you have Penix in a system where you have a good offensive line in front of him and you have the receivers that can create the separation and you can just keep them in the pocket, that's where he's great, where he has that platform under him and is, he's not really moving whatsoever. Um, and, and he can go to his first or his second read. That's when his arm talent plays way up. The rest of this stuff, though, is 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 where, you know, you want to keep him out of those situations. So for me, he, there, there's some flaws in that profile. That's why I have him as a second rounder. So, I mean, I was going to mention Bo Nix, but you kind of wrapped it up right now that, you know, he ran that Mickey Mouse offense, first read and everything else. You know, some people would be like, hey, but he's making the correct thing. I, there's just something weird about him. Like, like just, I, I don't know, not to attack his character because I think a lot of that is overblown sometimes. But, I, I mean, that Oregon offense, it just seemed like everybody was about three or four or five yards wide open. And that's why he had those, as you call them, empty calorie stats. Well, yeah, it's in the NFL the thing that you have to do is read the defense after the snap when the bullets are flying. You have to make the correct decision. It's, you know, it's like the Zach Galifianakis gif with all the different stuff, except everything is moving extremely quickly and you have to come up with the answer right away in that moment. It's not given to you in advance, right? So there, there's some, some art to that. The decision making when the bullets are flying in that moment, do you make the correct decision? And then physically, can you perform it? right? Like, can you keep your head about you to keep your mechanics about you to make an accurate pass, different stuff like this? Um, what Bo Nix did at, at Oregon, that system, it was all pre-snap reads. You know, like I said before, it's going to the line. You see the way that the defense is aligned to the way that, that you are spread out on offense. They'd be in shotgun, two receivers on the one side. You'd have one of the receivers far out wide on the other side. Sometimes you'd have the second one out there to the right as well. Sometimes you'd have the tight end. Um, and then you know where the numbers advantage are. Are they in one high? Are they on two high? Which way are they shading? Where are those defensive resources? Where is the numbers advantage? Do we have that on the left? Do we have that on the right? That's where the play call would go. Bo Nix would know where the ball was going before the snap came, and then it would come out right away. Uh, he had one of the, the lowest times to throw in this class. The reason for that is because he was given the answer in advance uh, every single time. This is where the ball is going. Um, and then he had one of the lowest A dots in the class, which speaks to the same thing. It was a lot of screen passes and different stuff like that. When you think about that and you, you think about the fact they faced the average defensive rank of 80th last year, and you think about the fact that some of these NFL things that we're talking about, sitting back in the pocket, surveying the field, having to make the correct decision with the bullets flying around you, then throwing downfield accurately, different stuff like that. That's the stuff Bo Nick struggles with. He doesn't have a cannon for an arm. Uh, he can spin it in the intermediate range. But as far as like downfield, the ball starts to flutter on him. He has to throw his, all of his body weight into it. And I don't trust him in the pocket. Uh, sitting back there and having to survey the defense while the bullets are flying. It's the thing that the Oregon uh, offensive system inoculated him from. It wasn't improvements in Bo Nix's game. 
the idea coming into this process that he was a mid first round pick and all this different stuff. I don't know about that. I don't know what you've seen that can support that. Uh, certainly an NFL system, you cannot base it on screen passes, pre-snap reads, and then yak yardage. That is not, that's not the way it's going to work in the NFL. So he's going to have to become a different type of quarterback and there's going to have to be a system built for him to accommodate that. You try to put him into some of these traditional concepts ask him to attack down the field, read the defense in the pocket, different stuff like that with the pass rush coming. That's where he got into all kinds of trouble at Auburn. There's nothing that I've seen that suggests that that has been addressed. He just didn't have to do it at, at Oregon. So to wrap things up, what's going on at Fantasy Pros and Betting Pros right now? Uh, me and my colleague Derek Brown have a new NFL draft show at Fantasy Pros. It's on the Fantasy Pros Dynasty feed. Uh, that's probably the thing we're, we're most excited for. Um, new thing. Uh I got that my first mock draft came out on Monday. I think it's my pinned tweet on Twitter. If anyone wants to see that, I, I put the comps there and the RAS scores and all that different stuff. We having a uh, mock a new mock draft just about every week going forward. And my uh, position rankings are going to be starting to drop on, you know, one by one on Fantasy Pros starting very quickly here, leading up to my 500 player big board with 500 comps, my baby, every process, which usually comes out about a week before the draft. That'll be on Fantasy Pros as well. And then Thor KU on Twitter. There you go. I was just about to ask, where can people follow you on Twitter? But it is at Thor KU. Hey, Thor, thanks for joining us. But that's all the time we got for the Viking Age podcast today. We do this every Monday with a late week episode right here on the Viking Age YouTube channel. We're on podcast form on Apple and Spotify the very next day. But however you consume us, make sure you rate, comment, like, and subscribe so you never miss a new episode and we can spread the word to the masses. For Thor Nystrom, I am Chris Shad. This has been the Viking Age Podcast.